Section 13 of Tales of Unrest, Second Part of the Return. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ray. Tales of Unrest by Joseph Conrad. Second Part of the Return. It was terrible. Not the fact, but the words. The words charged with the shadowy might of a meaning that seemed to possess the tremendous power to call fate down upon the earth. Like those strange and appalling words that sometimes are heard in sleep. They vibrated around him in a metallic atmosphere, in a space that had the hardness of iron and the resonance of a bell of bronze. Looking down between the toes of his boots, he seemed to listen thoughtfully to the receding wave of sound, to the wave spreading out in a widening circle, embracing streets, roofs, church steeples, fields, and travelling away, widening endlessly, far, very far, where he could not hear, where he could not imagine anything, where— And with that ass— he said again, without stirring in the least. And there was nothing but humiliation, nothing else. He could derive no moral solace from any aspect of the situation which radiated pain only on every side. Pain. What kind of pain? It occurred to him that he ought to be heartbroken, but in an exceedingly short moment he perceived that his suffering was nothing of so trifling and dignified a kind. It was altogether a more serious matter, and partook rather of the nature of those subtle and cruel feelings which are awakened by a kick or a horse-whipping. He felt very sick, physically sick, as though he had bitten through something nauseous. Life, that to a well-ordered mind should be a matter of congratulation, appeared to him, for a second or so, perfectly intolerable. He picked up the paper at his feet, and sat down with a wish to think it out, to understand why his wife, his wife, should leave him, should throw away respect, comfort, peace, decency, position, throw away everything for nothing. He set himself to think out the hidden logic of her action, a mental undertaking fit for the leisure hours of a madhouse, though he couldn't see it. And he thought of his wife in every relation except the only fundamental one. He thought of her as a well-bred girl, as a wife, as a cultured person, as the mistress of a house, as a lady. But he never for a moment thought of her simply as a woman. Then a fresh wave, a raging wave of humiliation, swept through his mind, and left nothing there but a personal sense of undeserved abasement. Why should he be mixed up with such a horrid exposure? It annihilated all the advantage of his well-ordered past, by a truth effective and unjust like a calumny, and the past was wasted. Its failure was disclosed, a distinct failure on his part to see, to guard, to understand. It could not be denied. It could not be explained away, hustled out of sight. He could not sit on it and look solemn. Now, if she had only died— if she had only died, he was driven to envy such a respectable bereavement, and one so perfectly free from any taint of misfortune, that even his best friend or his best enemy would not have felt the slightest thrill of exultation. No one would have cared. He sought comfort in clinging to the contemplation of the only fact of life that the resolute efforts of mankind had never failed to disguise in the clatter and glamour of phrases, and nothing lends itself more to lies than death. If she had only died, certain words would have been said to him in a sad tone, and he, with proper fortitude, would have made appropriate answers. There were precedents for such an occasion, and no one would have cared. If she had only died, the promises, the terrors, the hopes of eternity are the concern of the corrupt dead. But the obvious sweetness of life belongs to living, healthy men. And life was his concern. 
that sane and gratifying existence untroubled by too much love or by too much regret. She had interfered with it, she had defaced it, and suddenly it occurred to him he must have been mad to marry. It was too much in the nature of giving yourself away, of wearing it for a moment your heart on your sleeve. But every one married. Was all mankind mad? In the shock of that startling thought, he looked up, and saw to the left, to the right, in front, men sitting far off in chairs and looking at him with wild eyes, emissaries of his distracted mankind intruding to spy upon his pain and his humiliation. It was not to be borne. He rose quickly, and the others jumped up too, on all sides. He stood still in the middle of the room, as if discouraged by their vigilance. No escape! He felt something akin to despair. Everybody must know. The servants must know tonight. He ground his teeth. And he had never noticed, never guessed anything. Everyone will know. He thought, the woman's a monster, but everybody will think me a fool. And standing still in the midst of severe walnut wood furniture, he felt such a tempest of anguish within him that he seemed to see himself rolling on the carpet, beating his head against the wall. He was disgusted with himself, with a loathsome rush of emotion breaking through all the reserves that guarded his manhood. Something unknown, withering and poisonous, had entered his life, passed near him, touched him, and he was deteriorating. He was appalled. What was it? She was gone. Why? His head was ready to burst with the endeavour to understand her act and his subtle horror of it. Everything was changed. Why? Only a woman gone, after all. And yet he had a vision, a vision quick and distinct as a dream. The vision of everything he had thought indestructible and safe in the world crashing down about him, like solid walls do before the fierce breath of a hurricane. He stared shaking in every limb, while he felt the destructive breath, the mysterious breath, the breath of passion, stir the profound peace of the house. He looked round in fear. Yes, crime may be forgiven, uncalculating sacrifice, blind trust, burning faith, other follies may be turned to account. Suffering, death itself, may with a grin or a frown be explained away, but passion and the unpardonable and secret infamy of our hearts, a thing to curse, to hide and to deny, a shameless and forlorn thing that tramples upon the smiling promises, that tears off the placid mask, that strips the body of life. And it had come to him. It had laid its unclean hand upon the spotless draperies of his existence, and he had to face it alone with all the world looking on. All the world. And he thought that even the bare suspicion of such an adversary within his house carried with it a taint and a condemnation. He put both his hands out as if to ward off the reproach of a defying truth. And, instantly, the appalled conclave of unreal men, standing about mutely beyond the clear lustre of mirrors, made at him the same gesture of rejection and horror. He glanced vainly here and there, like a man looking in desperation for a weapon or for a hiding place, and understood at last that he was disarmed and concerned by the enemy that, without any squeamishness, would strike so as to lay open his heart. He could get help nowhere, or even take counsel with himself, because in the sudden shock of her desertion, the sentiments which he knew that in fidelity to his bringing up, to his prejudices and his surroundings he ought to experience, were so mixed up with the novelty of real feelings, of fundamental feelings that know nothing of creed, class, or education, that he was unable to distinguish clearly between what is and what ought to be, between the inexcusable truth and the valid pretenses. And he knew instinctively that truth would be of no use to him. Some kind of concealment seemed a necessity, because one cannot explain. Of course not. Who would listen? 
One had simply to be without stain and without reproach to keep one's place in the forefront of life. He said to himself, I must get over it the best I can, and began to walk up and down the room. What next? What ought to be done? He thought, I will travel. No, I won't. I shall face it out. And after that resolve, he was greatly cheered by the reflection that it would be a mute and easy part to play, for no one would be likely to converse with him about the abominable conduct of that, that woman. He argued to himself that decent people, and he knew no others, did not care to talk about such indelicate affairs. She had gone off with that unhealthy fat ass of a journalist. Why? He had been all a husband ought to be. He had given her a good position. She shared his prospects. He had treated her invariably with great consideration. He reviewed his conduct with a kind of dismal pride. It had been irreproachable. Then why? For love? Profanation! There could be no love there. A shameful impulse of passion. Yes, passion. His own wife. Good God! And the indelicate aspect of his domestic misfortune struck him with such shame that next moment he caught himself in the act of pondering absurdly over the notion whether it would not be more dignified for him to induce a general belief that he had been in the habit of beating his wife. Some fellows do, and anything would be better than that filthy fact. For it was clear he had lived with the root of it for five years, and it was too shameful. Anything, anything, brutality. But he gave it up directly, and began to think of the divorce court. It did not present itself to him, notwithstanding his respect for law and usage, as a proper refuge for dignified grief. It appeared rather as an unclean and sinister cavern where men and women are hailed by adverse fate to writhe ridiculously in the presence of uncompromising truth. It should not be allowed. That woman, five years! married five years, and never to see anything, not to the very last day, not till she coolly went off. And he pictured to himself all the people he knew engaged in speculating as to whether all the time he had been blind, foolish, or infatuated. What a woman! Blind! Not at all. Could a clean-minded man imagine such depravity? Evidently not. He drew a free breath. That was the attitude to take. It was dignified enough. It gave him the advantage, and he could not help perceiving that it was moral. He yearned unaffectedly to see morality, in his person, triumphant before the world. As to her, she would be forgotten. Let her be forgotten, buried in oblivion, lost. No one would elude. Refined people, and every man and woman he knew could be so described, had, of course, a horror of such topics. Had they? Oh, yes! No one would allude to her in his hearing. He stamped his foot, tore the letter across, then again and again. The thought of sympathizing friends excited in him a fury of mistrust. He flung down the small bits of paper. They settled, fluttering at his feet and looked very white on the dark carpet, like a scattered handful of snowflakes. This fit of hot anger was succeeded by a sudden sadness, by the darkening passage of a thought that ran over the scorched surface of his heart, like upon a barren plain, and after a fiercer assault of sun-rays, the melancholy and cooling shadow of a cloud. He realized that he had had a shock, not a violent or rending blow that can be seen, resisted, returned, forgotten, but a thrust, insidious and penetrating, that had stirred all those feelings, concealed and cruel, which the arts of the devil, the fears of mankind, God's infinite passion, perhaps, keep chained deep down in the inscrutable twilight of our breasts. A dark curtain seemed to rise before him, and for less than a second he looked upon the mysterious universe of moral suffering, as a landscape is seen complete and vast and vivid under a flash of lightning, so he could see disclosed in the moment 
all the immensity of pain that can be contained in one short moment of human thought. Then the curtain fell again, but his rapid vision left in Alvin Hervey's mind a trail of invincible sadness, a sense of loss and bitter solitude, as though he had been robbed and exiled. For a moment he ceased to be a member of society with a position, a career, and a name attached to all of this, like a descriptive label of some complicated compound. He was a simple human being, removed from the delightful world of crescents and squares. He stood alone, naked and afraid, like the first man on the first day of evil. There are in life events, contacts, glimpses, that seem brutally to bring all the past to a close. There is a shock and a crash, as of a gate flung to behind one by the perfidious hand of fate. Go and seek another paradise, fool or sage. There is a moment of dumb dismay, and the wanderings must begin again. The painful explaining away of facts the feverish raking up of illusions, the cultivation of a fresh crop of lies in the sweat of one's brow, to sustain life, to make it supportable, to make it fair, so as to hand intact to another generation of blind wanderers the charming legend of a heartless country, of a promised land, or flowers and blessings. He came to himself with a slight start, and became aware of an oppressive, crushing desolation. It was only a feeling, it is true, but it produced on him a physical effect, as though his chest had been squeezed in a vice. He perceived himself so extremely forlorn and lamentable, and was moved so deeply by the oppressive sorrow, that another turn of the screw, he felt, would bring tears out of his eyes. He was deteriorating. Five years of life in common had appeased his longing. Yes long time ago. The first five months did that, but there was the habit, the habit of her person, of her smile, of her gestures, of her voice, of her silence. She had a pure brow and good hair. How utterly wretched all this was, good hair and the eyes remarkably fine. He was surprised by the number of details that intruded upon his unwilling memory. He could not help remembering her footsteps, the rustle of her dress, her way of holding her head, her decisive manner of saying, Alvin, the quiver of her nostrils when she was annoyed. All that had been so much his property, so intimately and specially his. He raged in a mournful, silent way as he took stock of his losses. He was like a man counting the cost of an unlucky speculation, irritated, depressed, exasperated with himself and with others, with the fortunate, with the indifferent, with the callous. Yet the wrong done him appeared so cruel that he would perhaps have dropped a tear over that spoliation if it had not been for his conviction that men do not weep. Foreigners do. They also kill sometimes in such circumstances. And to his horror he felt himself driven to regret almost that the usages of a society ready to forgive the shooting of a burglar forbade him, under the circumstances, even as much as a thought of murder. Nevertheless, he clenched his fists and set his teeth hard. And he was afraid at the same time. He was afraid with that penetrating, faltering fear that seems, in the very middle of a beat, to turn one's heart into a handful of dust. The contamination of her crime spread out tainted the universe, tainted himself, woke up all the dormant infamies of the world, caused a ghastly kind of clairvoyance in which he could see the towns and fields of the earth, its sacred places, its temples and its houses, peopled by monsters, by monsters of duplicity, lust and murder. She was a monster. He himself was thinking monstrous thoughts. And yet he was like other people. How many men and women at this very moment were plunged in abominations, meditated crimes? It was frightful to think of. He remembered all the streets, the well-to-do streets he had passed on his way home, all the innumerable houses with closed doors and curtained windows. Each seemed now an abode of anguish and folly. And his thought, as of appalled, stood still, 
recalling with dismay the decorous and frightful silence that was like a conspiracy, the grim, impenetrable silence of miles of wars concealing passions, misery, thoughts of crime. Surely he was not the only man. His was not the only house. And yet no one knew, no one guessed. But he knew. He knew with unerring certitude that could not be deceived by the correct silence of walls, of closed doors, of curtained windows. He was beside himself with despairing agitation, like a man informed of a deadly secret, the secret of a calamity threatening the safety of mankind, the sacredness, the peace of life. End of second part of The Return Recording by Ray.